Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 16123 in the name of Donald Cameron on supporting Scottish agriculture. I would encourage members who wish to speak to press their request to speak buttons and I call on Donald Cameron to speak to and move the motion. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by moving the motion and also referring members to my register of interest in farming and crofting therein? Members, uh, many members here will be aware that we had a similar discussion in the Chamber about farming policy a couple of months ago. Uh, when, in fact, the Scottish Government's um, welcome, if belated U-turn on Elfast payments, dominated that debate, as did arguments about the UK and the Scottish Agriculture Bills. And for the record, we continue to believe that Scotland should be included in the UK Bill, and that by rejecting an offer to extend to Scotland powers in that Bill, that the SNP are failing Scottish agriculture. But we did not get as much discussion on the specifics of a future support system as many of us would have liked, and that's just one reason to bring this debate today, and I make no apology for that. In addition, while Brexit is in the forefront of many people's minds, that is no reason, in our view, for the Scottish Government to delay setting out their thinking on agricultural support. Leaving the EU and the Common Agricultural Policy provides us with a unique opportunity to rethink how we support farming. Almost three years have elapsed since the vote to leave the EU, and in comparison to England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, we have had precious little detail or leadership from the Scottish Government. I will briefly, yes. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. I'm for, for Mr Cameron giving way, and I, I don't accept what he says. However, could I ask, do the Scottish Conservatives have any specific policy of their own with regard to the future of financial support for Scottish agriculture? Donald Cameron. I look forward to setting that out right now. Um, likewise, the uh, continuing round of government expert groups, task forces, advisory bodies and consultation exercises should not prevent the government from providing details. However well-intentioned these groups are and however well-qualified the people who contribute, we now need to see concrete specifics from the government. The fact is that Scotland's agricultural community remains firmly in the dark about the SNP's plans for support and what they want to achieve for farmers, crofters and land managers. Unlike other parts of the UK and Scotland, we've had little direction, lots of posturing, and no real action. This is why we have brought forward this debate today, to set forward our plans for supporting Scottish agriculture. If the SNP won't set out their vision, then we will. And I look forward to contributions from across the chamber. And I really think we can build a consensus around several of the points made. There is an overlap with many of the principles I think many of us share. Our starting point is that any support system must not create friction with the internal UK market, by far our biggest market, and of crucial importance to our farmers and crofters. Our focus is on practical, simple support that farmers can access easily and quickly. We want government to support environmental measures, new technologies, new entrants to farmers, and flexibility for those in farming, as well as just those who wish to exit the sector with dignity. Scotland's unique landscape poses challenges and opportunities which we will embrace. Above all, Scotland's farmers deserve an ambitious programme of support and encouragement that will ensure our rural communities capitalise on the opportunity we now have. And as our motion states, we believe there are several key principles which must be adhered to. They are as follows. First and foremost, we believe that food production and productivity must be at the heart of future farming policy. This is vital if the Scottish Government is to achieve its ambition of doubling the value of food and drink from 15 billion to 30 billion by 2030, an ambition we share Scotland has some of the finest food and drink products in the world, and it's important we create the conditions for the sector to thrive and for producers to maintain the supply of high-quality goods. But we believe that in order to ensure this growth does not come at a cost to producers, we must do all that we can to guarantee our farmers and crofters get a fair return for their products. So we propose working with the UK government to widen and strengthen the power of the groceries code adjudicator so that our food suppliers are treated more fairly. We would also look to work with the UK government to ensure that better and clearer food labelling helps build brands and delivers better prices and hence drive up sales and productivity. And given that last year, total income from farming fell by 8%, with productivity falling for the third year in a row, we want to reverse these worrying trends. Another important step is to encourage and incentivise farmers to invest in new technologies, such as GPS targeting input system for arable farms and new weighing systems to make farming and crofting smarter and more efficient. Secondly, we believe in regional differentiation. There must be a recognition that Scottish agriculture has unique circumstances with 85% of land classed as less favoured. 
The remoteness of many of our farms and crofts often drives up costs and makes it more difficult to transport livestock. The NFUS have said that any sudden loss of support to less favoured areas could render many hill farms and crofts unsustainable. And we too believe that a tailored Scottish system should deliver a menu of targeted options which are designed to, to regional and sectoral needs as opposed to a one-size-fits-all approach. A key component of a future agricultural policy, thirdly, is environmental protection. This must, we must recognise our commitments to protecting the environment and reducing our carbon footprint. And I want to put on record my admiration for the many things that farmers and crofters already do to reduce carbon emissions voluntarily, from planting hedgerows and trees to improving animal health and diet <coughs> to cut methane output. We are already seeing this challenge being taken seriously by the sector. And we agree with the NFUS that there's huge potential in having a suite of environmental measures which offers real but practical choices to every farm and croft. We think that we need to promote the environment specifically as one of the key priorities for farming policy and assist those in the sector with what they're already doing. Fourthly, we believe in simplification. Having seen the chaos caused by the government's inability to deliver cap payments on time, it's clear that any future support system must be different. It should be easier to access and to apply for. It should be simpler to administer and be able to deal with genuine mistakes and errors. We believe there must be a clear distinction between minor and major non-compliance with proportionate penalties in any given case. We should aim to reduce bureaucracy and there should be fewer but better targeted inspections. In short, removing many of the burdens that exist and delivering a system which supports our farmers and crofters instead of working against them. Fifthly and lastly, we believe that the future of Scottish agriculture can only be encouraged, can only be guaranteed by encouraging the next generation to enter it. We have to be able to attract new entrants so we can ensure farming and crofting remain sustainable and productive, making it easier to work in the sector, offering new opportunities to develop new skills, promoting diversification of business, flexible working, and as I've said earlier, making it easier for those who want to leave farming should they wish to. It's vital we equip farmers with the skills and training to drive up productivity while also supporting complementary enterprises which those in the sector are undertaking alongside farming. A large part of that will come down to how much we invest in education, research, development and innovation, but it also acknowledges the role of advisory services. And in addition, we support a rural network to raise awareness and provide a link with innovation. Um, I note the various motions, the amendments to the motion. I sympathise with elements of, of actually both the government's and the, the Labour motion, um, Labour amendment, uh, particularly Rhoda Grant's um, comments on rural poverty and repopulation. I'm very sympathetic to that. I just wonder if it's suitable for agricultural support funding to, to specify and promote those, those particular things. But in conclusion, De uh, Presiding Officer, we've laid out some of our ideas. We'll actively work with the government to see these come to fruition. But we do this in the absence of any real concrete ideas from the SNP. So let me end with some questions, though without any great expectation of answers. What system of support can farmers expect going forward? Will it be easier to use? What specific support will the government offer to encourage farmers to, in, to cut carbon, attract the next generation and drive up productivity? Do they believe that we should recognise regional differences and tailor support to the unique needs of farming and crofting? What is the government's position on capping of payments and the length of any transition period? And when can we expect to see a Scottish agriculture bill? Because our agricultural communities rightly expect concrete proposals to be able to plan for the future. The Scottish Conservatives are willing to make that case. Now is the time for the SNP to do so too. Thank you. I call on Mary Goujon to speak to the move amendment 16123.2. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I very much welcome the opportunity to debate the support that we give to our farming and crofter sector because it is one of the iconic industry that not only forms part of our diverse rural economy but is an absolutely integral part of our economy as a whole. But I have to take serious issue with the motion that's been put forward by Donald Cameron today for a single reason, and that's it's quite astonishing and glaring omission, because the one thing that Donald Cameron fails to mention is the single biggest threat to farmers, crofters, a rural economy in Scotland as a whole, and that's Brexit. We are only 23 days away from exit day. We still have no idea whether we're leaving with a bad deal or a truly catastrophic de no deal. 
And that's something that the UK government belligerently refuses to rule out. And that belligerence translates into recklessness. A reckless failure to give certainty on the future funding arrangements, a reckless inability to rule out tariffs on our most valuable exports, and a callous recklessness in refusing to give certainty to the EU citizens who live and work across our rural, coastal and island communities. Now that's why as a government we've made our position clear. We will continue to support farming and crofting through payment of CAP support this year and next. We've set out our proposals for stability and simplicity and a clear five-year plan to see the industry through the transition following the UK's exit from the EU and beyond. Scotland is the only part of the UK with such a detailed transition plan. Our commitment to that work is already being put into effect by the Simplification Task Force, which first met in December and met again on the 13th of February. Further, on the 10th of January, with a Lib Dem amendment, we as a parliament agreed to convene a group of producers, consumers and environmental organisations to inform and recommend a new bespoke policy on farming and food production for Scotland. The quite simple fact is that while we are taking these concrete steps in Scotland, south of the border, the UK government takes us ever closer to that Brexit cliff edge. But as if the persistent threat of a no-deal Brexit 23 days from the EU exit wasn't enough, we still have no clarity on a number of key issues that is affecting our rural economy right now. The UK government has said it will continue to commit the same cash total in funds for farm support until the end of the UK Parliament term, but we still don't even know what that farm support means. Not all of Pillar 2 funding is guaranteed, putting at risk investment in forestry. And also LEADER, which has played an integral role in empowerment for local rural communities for over 25 years. I spoke at an event in Parliament just last Wednesday to recognise the massive impact that LEADER has had in our rural areas and opened a LEADER-funded community hub in my home city of Brechin on Saturday morning, one of four projects in Brechin alone. The Tory motion is shamefully silent on these questions over future funding and implications for our wider rural economy. And in the two and a bit years since the referendum, we've had just one statement on the detail of the shared prosperity fund. There was due to be a consultation on that last year, but we're still waiting. What exactly will that fund? Who knows? We also need to recognise the very real and immediate threats across the whole rural economy. Farmers, fishers, seafood producers will be hit harder than anyone else. If the UK doesn't receive third country listing from day one, we would lose access to 96% of our export market for lamb. If we get that listing, sheep meat would see tariffs of around 40% and we can expect the same tariffs across red meat. The EU is also a key market for seafood exports, accounting for 77% of all our overseas seafood exports. They will be particularly badly hit by non-tariff barriers, such as the need for export health certificates, which would see a fourfold increase in admi administration for the salmon industry alone, costing an extra £15 million a year. No word of that in the Tory motion. No. People right across our food supply chains are being forced to spend from the tens of thousands to millions of pounds to prepare for a no-deal Brexit, a situation that may never happen, but which the UK government refuses to rule out. But above all that, what lies at the heart of all of this are people. The people who work on our farms, on our crofts, in the abattoirs, in processing, and in those jobs that keep our rural economy going. The nurses, the social care workers, those in hospitality, and a large number of those are EU citizens. In the North East, 70% of those working in fish processing are EU citizens, 95% of vets in abattoirs. How will our rural economy continue to function without the people who sit at its very heart? But this isn't just about the economic imperative behind the free movement of people. We're actually talking about people's lives. And I would love to hear what the Tories have to say to my family, to my friends, and to the hundreds of thousands of other families who are affected by the hostile environment that their government has created. People who now have to apply for the right to stay in Scotland, many of whom have only known Scotland as their only home. Yes. John Scott. Most, if not all, of the problems that you outline are happening on your watch, Minister. This is nothing to do with Brexit. They're happening on your watch now. Answer that. Mr. Marie Goujon. So the threat to EU citizens is happening on our watch when it's policies that are pursued by the Tory government in, the, in Westminster. And that's happening on our watch. I, your policies are absolutely abhorrent and I have absolutely, no, uh, absolutely nothing to do with them. And as I say, it's affecting my family and it's affecting hundreds of thousands of other families right across the country right now. Now, in this Parliament on the 10th of January, we were able to achieve consensus around our shared approach to future rural policy. 
Compare that with the approach taken south of the border, with 26 ministerial resignations over Brexit since last year, the most recent of which was George Eustace, the agricultural minister. Such little faith does he have in his own government's policy direction. That is why I will take absolutely no lectures or lessons from the Tories when it comes to rural policy. The Scottish Government will continue to do what it has good. always That's done. Stand up for our farmers, our crofters, our fishermen, the fish processors, EU citizens, our rural and island communities, while working collaboratively to build policy for the future. I therefore move the Government Amendment in my name. Thank you. And I now call Rhoda Grant to speak to and move Amendment 16123.1. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, two months ago, we had a similar debate and an attempt to try and provide our crofters and farmers with an indication of what will Scotland's priorities for agriculture be post-Brexit. And we appear to be no further forward. I can't disagree with either the Conservative motion or the government amendment to it. I would have hoped that the government would have used theirs to provide more detail. Yes, Brexit has caused this uncertainty, but the Scottish Government simply cannot wash their hands of it. Um, it is for government to govern regardless of the circumstances they find themselves in. It is, it is for them to steer the direction of travel for our farmers and crofters and give them the information they need to plan for Brexit. Scottish Government simply cannot carry on as was. And this, the mood of this debate has been unhelpful so far. Rather than trade insults across the chamber, the Scottish Government must use this opportunity and this debate to provide an outline of their plans. Our current system is very biased towards production. It allows farmers who could run profitable businesses without support to receive the lion's share of the support available. The top five recipients of single farm payment in Scotland receive more than the bottom 3,500 recipients combined. Sadly, 45% of farms make an in income equivalent to less than the minimum agricultural wage, with 23% making a loss. And that's why this is about poverty as well. These businesses are arguably offering more by the way of public goods, and they receive the least by the way of funding. And I said all of this a month ago, and I want to hear what the Scottish Government has done since then as a result of what was said in that debate. How has the government planned to ensure public money is used for public good rather than personal gain? Our amendment sets priorities for an inclusive system that directs investment to where it is most needed and tackles rural and food poverty and supports repopulation. The Scottish Government have two opportunities to lay out their future policy. They have an agriculture bill and a good food nation bill. And if they were truly ambitious, there would be one bill encompassing both and making the connection between support and outcomes. We have fantastic produce that's world renowned, yet many of our people are malnourished. Therefore, what we want from our farmers, farmers and crofters has to be the basis of the new farming support scheme. And central to that is a good food nation bill. Brian Whittle. And I'm grateful, Rhoda Grant, for giving way. Would she agree with me that the opportunity exists here to expand uh, uh, the, the, that great food that she talks about into our schools and uh, into our hospitals, where only 16% of the government controlled Excel contract, procurement contract, currently comes from Scotland? Rhoda Grant. Indeed, I, I do agree with that, and I'm just going to come to that. So if I can finish making this point and, and come along to that, because I think that is a point that has to be made. Uh, we agree with the principles of sustainability, simplicity, innovation, inclusion, productivity, profitability, and they're all laudable, but we also want a right to food. Too many children are growing up in food poverty, storing up problems for future generations in the health service that they will have and it also affects their lifespan and their life chances. And farming and crofting are also economic drivers as well as food producers. Uh, but often the profitability of the industry goes to those because of those in a long food chain uh, between field and fork. And we need, uh, as Brian Whittle said in his intervention, to find ways of tackling this because rural poverty is sure, it surely could be tackled by shortening that food chain and keeping the wealth in our communities. Looking at local procurement could cut costs to the public sector while also supporting our local agriculture industry, allowing farmers and crofters to sell direct to public bodies 
is the potential we've always talked about in this parliament, but we've never realized. We need to encourage cooperative working between individual businesses that would allow them to compete and ensure uh, and compete for those contracts and ensure uh, the supply of goods. But we also need to make sure to look at ways how small producers on their own could access that too. Um, we need enterprises to support them, get them off the ground and help them work towards being able to, to procure to this market. The new schemes also must recognise uh, that, for, that, uh, that, that cooperative working is really important and must encourage it rather than discourage it, which the current schemes often do at the moment, not recognising things like um, the, um, equipment rings and indeed uh, common graces, which are, are fundamental to rural farming and crofting. If we're to halt depopulation and turn it around, we must Im maximise the impact on the industry and make sure that secondary processing also remains in communities as well. We recognise the uncertainty that prevails and the impact that this is having on our agriculture sec sector. We need an indication of what the future holds and we believe that we have an opportunity to build a policy and strategy that supports farming communities going forward. Thank you very much. And I now call Mark Ruskell to open for the Green Party. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Once again, we're debating a motion on farming policy which fails to address the crisis that climate change poses to our farms, our coastlines, our communities, and to future generations in Scotland. Now, during the debate in this chamber on the 10th of January, I made it clear that the Greens cannot support any future farm support system or farming policy which does not have addressing climate change as a core principle. And our position has not changed on this matter. I lodged an amendment to that debate calling for agriculture to play a key role in addressing the climate emergency we currently face and for farming support systems to be used to develop a net zero emissions sector in Scotland. Now, the Cabinet Secretary at that time failed to speak to my amendment once in that debate, so I'm still unsure as to why the government voted against it, but an explanation of why the government is so opposed to climate change mitigation uh, forming such a core principle of our farm support system uh, would be welcome from the minister today. I know I'm not alone in my frustrations on this. The Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee this week published our stage one report on the climate change bill, which included the following observation. I quote from the report, the area where divergence from the UK Climate Change Committee advice is most apparent is in relation to agriculture policy. In the most recent climate change plan, the CCC recommended an approach which was subsequently rejected by the Scottish Government without an explanation provided to justify the decision. And in its most recent report, the UK Climate Change Committee also noted that, and I'll quote again, not all our recommendations have been implemented. In the agriculture sector, ambitions for emissions reduction have been further scaled back from the draft plan. The body established to specifically advise government on its climate change plan has made it clear that we're going in the wrong direction and we're ignoring their advice. So Eclair's uh, climate bill report goes on to recommend that, I'll quote again, the Scottish Government give urgent consideration to the agriculture sector and that uh, adopting a holistic approach to emissions accounting, recognizing the activities across the sector that play a positive role in reducing emissions, such as afforestation, peatland restoration, and highlighting the opportunities that can arise by developing new rural support mechanisms that encourage this. And I'm looking ahead at, at John Scott here. He will recognize those words, and he's nodding very sagely there in the corner. This recommendation from a parliament committee makes it clear that we are not heaping undue blame on the agriculture sector for emissions, as some would accuse us, because agriculture is both a cause and a solution to climate change emissions. By leaving out climate change from our discussions of agricultural support, we are denying the fundamental role that the industry can play in mitigation and shutting off a potentially valuable source of funding for our farmers. We're also denying the farming sector the chance for a just transition. And again, this was something that was discussed on a number of occasions in the committee evidence, with agriculture specifically singled out for its vulnerability. A just transition will not come about by ignoring the difficult conversations. We have to recognize the wide range of approaches that are currently in the sector and make sure we're not just promoting, but financially supporting the best examples of low carbon farming in Scotland. 
And the answers are out there in the industry already. Initiatives like the Nature Friendly Farming Network, established by farmers themselves, are leading the way in low carbon sustainable farming. And I find it incomprehensible they should not be rewarded for their approach to climate change in our future farm support system. We're working towards the position where I hope that most of us in this chamber would agree to the public money for public goods approach to subsidies. What bigger public good is there than being part of the solution to climate change and helping Scotland achieve net zero emissions? Thank you very much. And I call Mike Rumbles. I would like to thank the Conservative Party for using its debating time in the chamber today to raise the important issue of our rural economy. But unfortunately, I believe that Donald Cameron, while having, I am sure, the best of intentions, uh, fails to recognize what has to be, what has to be the way forward for our rural economy. In his motion, he calls on the Scottish Government to set out its position regarding the main elements of a future support system for farming. No, if it did, that would be to ignore what our Parliament decided on the 10th of January. Can you imagine the uproar in this chamber if the Minister did this and decided to ignore the will of Parliament? This Parliament decided in a vote after our debate that the way forward for the government would be, and I quote, convene a group consisting of producer, consumer, and environmental organizations to inform and recommend a new bespoke policy on farming and food production for Scotland. That's what Parliament decided. This has to be the way forward if we're to design a new bespoke system of rural support that has buy-in from all our stakeholders. Indeed, the government's amendment today would have contained a reference to this commitment, but I agreed to lodge it myself as an amendment to the government's amendment, and unfortunately, the presiding officer decided not to call my amendment. So because of that, we don't have an opportunity to vote again to reconfirm Parliament's and the Scottish Government's commitment here. And I don't question the presiding officer's decision. Perhaps he felt, maybe I'm assuming something, perhaps he felt that Parliament didn't, didn't need a vote to reconfirm what we have already decided. I absolutely accept that. However, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will, during his summing up, update us on the work he's been doing to establish the group so that we can indeed see that work is underway to recommend a bespoke system which will actually work for Scotland. Now, I don't wish to be unkind to Donald Cameron, but the Conservative call for the government to outline the new system we need is a typically, if I may say so, paternalistic approach. They seem to want the government to tell our producers, consumers and environmental organisations that the government always knows best. Simply ignoring buy-in from our producer, consumer and environmental stakeholders. It's a recipe for failure, a recipe for failure if we went down that route uh, that he wants us to go down. And that's why today the call from the Conservatives must be resisted once again. Now, Donald, Donald Cameron tried this approach during the debate on the 10th of January, and Parliament said no then, and unfortunately, Donald Cameron repeatedly misses the point here, and he's back again with very much the same motion. Now, turning to the Labour amendment, we will support the amendment, but we do have to be careful of not preempting the work of the producer, consumer, and environmental organisations forming the new group. As I said in the debate on the 10th of January, in designing a new and bespoke system of support for a rural economy that works, the Rural Economy Secretary has a difficult, it's not going to be easy, a difficult task ahead of him. And we must make that extra effort not to, to create false divisions, because I think that's what's happening, create false divisions between us simply for party advantage. Even now, I would call on the Conservatives to engage with this inclusive approach because I said in this chamber in our debate in January, and it's worth repeating, the great prize is a bespoke and successful system of rural support that will, will enable our rural economy to overcome the real challenges it faces and to thrive. Surely, isn't that what we all want to see? Thank you. And we turn to the open part of the debate. I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Alistair Allen. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to refer members to my register of interest in that I'm a partner in a farming business. Presiding Officer, someone who has a farm, who comes from a family that's farmed for three generations, and someone who spent 12 years of their professional 
uh, life offering advice to farmers. I believe it's right that I have strong and informed views on farming. I believe farming is a long-term business. And long-term businesses don't always mirror the patterns of normal businesses. And surprisingly enough, they don't mirror the patterns of an election cycle of a parliament. Farmers have to plan 10 years in advance to ensure that the huge capital costs that they are required to make in their businesses are well invested. Preparing for the future is everything, and being able to predict the future is all important. That's why Cabinet Secretary farmers up and down the country are getting more and more frustrated with your lack of forward planning and your lack of a long-term vision for Scottish farming. Now, the Cabinet Secretary, will no doubt, will always point to his stability and simplicity document. I believe you, were, you waived it earlier. Well, really, my question to you, what workable, comprehensive plan has 46 questions? If I went to my boss when I was working in, in private practice and said, here's a plan with 46 questions, I don't think he would have given me a fair win. So I believe it is quite simple in what it says, but it offers no certainty, and it certainly offers no vision for the future. Now, farmers are not seeing enough progress, Cabinet Secretary, and that is what we Conservatives are now calling on the Scottish Government to get on with. Too much analysis, Cabinet Secretary, can often lead to paralysis. Firstly, let's look at one of the points we've talked about, and that is productivity. Scottish farms for far too long have plateaued. Barley yields per acre have hardly increased in 20 years. We need to be far more progressive in the use of our new technology, from using smart or digital technology to, sorry, to boost crop yields, to investigating how we can improve resilience through plant and animal breeding. Secondly, we now have an opportunity with a new system as we develop it to really recognise the differences between the lowlands and the highlands, and well, that, that future policy must do that. Clearly, as there is a difference between the productivity of the alluvial, coastal and riverine plains to the pioneer habitats and the upper slopes of the hills that we have. One policy can never suit all, as we've seen in the past, and we must make sure that we lay out what we want to achieve from each of the habitats that we have across Scotland. Thirdly, we believe farmers are indeed the custodians of the countryside. We all benefit from the landscape our farmers maintain and have produced over hundreds of years. And we agree that the principle of public money for public good must be the heart of future funding. Fourthly, we believe that the current funding system is far too complicated. We've stressed time and time again the penalties for errors are too stringent. Frankly, if the government's agencies have been fined for their errors in delivering agricultural support in the same way that farmers are for trying to receive it, they would be bankrupt. Now, here's an idea for you, Cabinet Secretary. You asked for them. We could simplify the system by using the many assurance schemes that are currently in place to form the basis of the information checking that goes on farm. This would cost less because farmers are paying for it. They would be more efficient and perhaps would result in a decrease of the demand for the staff that you have, which I believe are in the region of 750 staff to implement this scheme. Finally, Cabinet Secretary, we've got to secure future farming careers. Now, I see that the time is tight, but I would make this comment. I believe we've got to the situation on land reform that we are not seeing new tenancies created. So there are no new tenancies because of this legislation. So we've got older farmers, less land to rent, less income to farmers, and greater reliance on subsidies. That all points to failures. Presiding officer, I believe farmers have been left in the dark for too long by this cabinet secretary, who's playing politics with farmers as he uses Brexit to introduce, today introducing a Scottish agricultural bill, or signing up to the UK agriculture bill. Cabinet secretary, it's time for you to stop sitting on the fence. Farmers don't want you there and don't need you there. We want you to get back to backing Scottish farming and coming up with a plan, which fundamentally you've failed to do. Thank you. I just encourage members to speak through the chair, not to use the term you all the time. Alistair Allen to be followed by Colin Smith. Thanks, President Officer. Crofting uh, is a major part of the fabric of life in my constituency. The Western Isles are home to approximately a third of all of Scotland's crofts, with over 6,000 island crofts spread out among nearly 300 townships. 
crofting is closely connected to the way of life, the culture, and uh, even the language of the islands that I represent. And there are some very real challenges facing the future of crofting. The age profile of crofters is older than the rest of the population. There remains a difficulty in attracting new entrants, something which is not helped by the occasional casually dismissive remark that crofters are, quote, people who have a couple of sheep in the back garden, a quote directly attributable, sadly, to the opposition benches in the past. But the high levels of bureaucracy associated with crofting are a source of constant frustration. And a recent survey showed that 95% of crofters do not see crofting uh, as economically viable without supplementing their incomes in other ways. It's worth mentioning, therefore, the importance of the less favoured area support scheme to my constituency. Uh, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his commitment to finding a solution uh, that will deliver funding under LFAS at approximately 100% for this year and the next two scheme years. Now, I like and respect Mr Cameron, uh, not least for his knowledge of this subject, but today's motion fails, in my view, to take account uh, of one other thing that makes crofters anxious at the moment. When people in my constituency say Shabuurachahoun or Shabrochanahoun or worse, they are talking about Brexit and the catastrophe that the UK government's handling of it represents. Brexit, although some members have decided it shouldn't be brought into this debate, has added huge new uncertainties for crofting. A survey of crofters conducted in November by the Scottish Crofting Federation found that 14% of respondents uh, were confident about the future compared to 31% who classified themselves as despondent and 55% of respondents were uncertain, citing Brexit uh, and the potential knock-on effects on prices and support payments. Now, we can only marvel at the blame-shifting exercise underway today uh, in a motion from the Conservative Party. Uh, given that we are now only 23 days from Brexit, we still don't know what kind of Brexit we are facing. We don't know what markets uh, producers will be able to sell into. We don't know the rules that will govern them. We do not know whether their exports will face high tariffs. We do not know what kind of customs checks they may expect to face. Yet having dragged us, or in Scotland's case, the more appropriate word might be shoved us onto the cliff edge of a disastrous hard Brexit, the Tories have the sheer brass neck to turn around today and say that it is the uncertainty from the Scottish Government which is having a detrimental impact on farmers and crofters. There is a large body of evidence which uh, shows that Scotland's agriculture sector would be worse off under every conceivable Brexit scenario. So I would ask members opposite who so casually dismiss these concerns to support calls from these benches for the UK government to guarantee that farmers and crofters will be compensated in the event of a no deal. But, presiding officer, although I've focused on some of the risks at a will, uh, Liam Kerr, but very briefly, please. Uh, I'm grateful for that. Surely all of this uncertainty could be taken away if the SNP would vote for the withdrawal agreement. Yeah. Yeah. Allen. Uh, I, I hesitate. I hesitate to remind the member that his own party are not showing any signs at present of voting for their own deal. Uh, so I think that, that remark can be taken uh, really as a representative of, of the species of foolishness uh, which it probably represents. But, presiding officer, although I've focused on some of the, the risks that Brexit poses to crofting, uh, I do so not because they're um, the only threats to crofting, far from it. I could happily uh, spend an afternoon, but I won't, berating grey lag geese alone. But I mention these threats, presiding officer, in conclusion, because they are at the latest reckoning some 561 hours away. Thank you very much. I call Colin Swift to be followed by Gail Ross. Thank you, presiding officer. Ensuring that we provide the right support for agriculture and rural communities in the wake of Brexit is essential, not just for the, the sector and the communities that depend on it, but for Scotland's economy as a whole. Agriculture is a vital source of employment and income in the rural areas and the foundation of a food and drink sector that is worth billions of pounds and countless jobs across the whole of Scotland. However, agriculture is also one of the sectors that is put most at risk by the utter chaos of the current Brexit process. During this time of uncertainty, we need the UK government to take a no-deal Brexit off the table. But we also need more direction, detail and clarity from the Scottish Government on their long-term vision for the future of agriculture beyond five years. It brings together the many stakeholders within the sector. And the last time we debated this topic in the Chamber, the Cabinet Secretary agreed, as a result of pressure, 
from opposition parties to convene a group to develop in detail a new policy. But as yet, we've seen little progress on this. The Minister mentioned that commitment again today, but still provided no detail. Now, given the urgency of this matter and the scale of the work to be undertaken by that group, this lack of progress is a deep concern. Now, except there are challenges caused by the continued uncertainty about long-term funding from the UK Government, I share the frustration of the Scottish Government on this point. But I don't accept that's an excuse to delay developing, in partnership with stakeholders, far more detail around proposals for a Scottish system. We should be making the case for the level of funding we need and putting forward credible, detailed plans that show what a new Scottish system could look like in the long term. That system needs to incorporate the principles outlined in the motion, productivity, regional differentiation, environmental protection, simplification, research and education. And a great deal of agreement exists across a range of stakeholders for these aims. There's also widespread recognition of the need to do more to support environmental sustainability in the sector, taking into account factors such as emissions, biodiversity and air and soil quality. Likewise, it's broadly agreed that payment should be set up in a way that better fosters a culture of innovation and entrepreneurialism in the sector by making funding available for measures intended to increase productivity and resilience. Um, I'll give away briefly. Edward Mountain. It's a very quick question. In your vision, vision for the future, do you foresee a, a reduction in the £50 million a year it costs to administer the current scheme? Colin Smith. I, I would certainly hope so, but, um, it, and it's interesting that that actually has risen uh, in the last budget as well, which is certainly a, 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 a matter of concern, I have to say. Now, beyond this, we, we also need reforms to support, I think, a more equitable distribution of the funding that is available, irrespective of the cost of running that system. The current, system emph uh, current emphasis on direct payments provides large and often wealthy landowners with a significant sum of money, while 45 per cent of farms generate income that works out below the minimum agriculture wage. Funding needs to be allocated more fairly and according to the principle of public good for public money. It should promote inclusive growth and a wide range of social benefits as well as economic and environmental ones. And there needs to be support in place to compensate for natural disadvantages such as biophysical restraints and remoteness. LFAS is currently a lifeline for many farmers and crofters and the Cabinet Secretary must guarantee not only protecting against the up and coming 60% cut but also make clear a source, it will be a source of support of this kind in the long term. Our future support system should also be used to improve support for animal welfare, for example, better incentivising those who make the choice to keep calves and cows together longer and supporting the rearing of male dairy calves instead of exporting them. There's growing concern that the live export of animals for fattening and slaughter does nothing to positively promote Scottish agriculture and we should be bringing this practice to an end or the government's claim to support the process of meat production close to where animals are born and reared is a worthless claim. And there needs to be a clear commitment to a replacement for leader funding. Crucially, our new agriculture support system must also work to tackle the scandal of food poverty in Scotland. Signed officer, it's an absolute disgrace that children in Scotland still go to bed hungry in a country with a world-class food and drink sector. The new agricultural support system must help the sector fulfil people's basic human right to food, a right I once again call on the Scottish Government to enshrine in law. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Gail Ross to be followed by John Scott. Thank you, President Officer. Um, this motion we are debating today from the Tories does feel a bit like Groundhog Day. I wonder if you remember this, that the Parliament acknowledges that future policy for Scotland's rural economy should be founded on key principles, including sustainability, simplicity, innovation, inclusion, productivity and profitability. That's very similar to the motion that we are debating today. But that was the motion put forward by the Scottish Government on the 10th of January, which does include a proposal from the Liberal Democrats, which Mike Rumble spoke of earlier, to convene a group consisting of producer, consumer and environmental organisations to inform. We debated that at length, but the Tories voted against it. In that debate, Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing opened by saying, we are 78 days away from Brexit, yet we do not know the sort of Brexit that we face. What is clear is that none of the Brexit options is good for Scotland's rural economy. All are problematic for sectors such as farming, food and drink, aquaculture, forestry and fisheries. Well, presiding officer, as has been said, we are now only 23 days away from Brexit and it's very clear that nothing has changed. Everyone in this chamber, whether they admit it or not, knows that the real and present threat to the rural economy, the real 
detrimental effect is not some perceived inertia from the Scottish Government. The biggest threat to every sector in Scotland, including the rural economy, is being taken out of the European Union. Brexit will damage UK agriculture, regardless of whether we come out with no deal or indeed Theresa May's bad deal. Our farmers have no certainty that they'll even have access to the European market at the end of this month. Sheep farmers with UK sheep meat exports worth £390 million a year, nearly 90% of which is destined for the European market, now face the prospect of tariffs as high as 45 to 50% being forced on them. Devastating. Our celebrated food and drink sector that Colin Smith just referenced estimate that a no deal could lead to a loss of two billion pounds worth of sales. And this is based on the UK government's own economic projections. Fresh, chilled or perishable products that attract a premium for quality and freshness our seafood, our red meat, poultry, fruit, veg and dairy could be delayed and spoiled due to extended customs checks. Our red meat industry faces obliteration in the current export market due to the punitive tariffs and the problem will be exacerbated if the UK adopts a policy of low or no tariffs or checks of equivalent imports, I'm sorry, I don't have time, which could ultimately flood the market. And what's going to happen to our precious PGI status? Presiding officer, to quote from the NFUS discussion paper on a new agricultural policy for Scotland post-Brexit, it says, change is inevitable, but change must be managed and not chaotic. But all we're seeing from Westminster with Brexit is chaos. We want to do things differently in Scotland, and we will. The Scottish Government have already said that they are working on plans for future support. The Cabinet Secretary gave a statement in this chamber recently and outlined our plans. And the Minister also laid it out in her opening statement. Future support must be simplified. We all agree with that. It should support the whole of our countryside and, yes, the environment. It should reward good practice and productivity and stewardship of the land. But it should also measure carbon impact and biodiversity. But above all, it must be fair. It must support communities and it must work for everyone. But to say that we are sitting back and doing nothing is just not true. Thank you. And I call John Scott to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And may I begin by declaring an interest as a farmer, food producer and member of NFUS and welcome Donald Cameron's motion. However, before I move to the content of our motion, I want to raise with the Cabinet Secretary the spectre raised in last week's Sunday Times and by Gail Ross as well of 9 million lambs across the UK being unsaleable into the EU market this year with or without a Brexit deal with potential losses of around £100 per head facing sheep farmers this year. And, Presiding Officer, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what plans he has to deal with this problem? on behalf of the many sheep farmers in Scotland, and therefore can I urge him to vote for the deal? And just asking this question of the Cabinet Secretary, who I wish would uh, keep quiet from the sedentary position he occupies, uh, Presiding Officer illustrates the point I want to make, that while we are discussing the future shape of rural Scotland here today, the much bigger question is how many working farmers will there be in our landscape at all in future? NFUS has declared their vision to be actively farmed hectares, but these, but these landscapes require people in them to make them work, and too many livestock farmers can't currently make a living, as demonstrated by this year's TIF figures, historic TIF figures, I would say, which may come as some surprise to Mary Goujon and Gail Ross, sufficient to allow them to continue actively farming or environmentally enhancing our countryside, and this is happening now and before Brexit, Minister. And the government continues to make life harder for those trying to make a living with this week laying the instrument to introduce beavers as part of their project to create wilderness landscapes in Scotland. Seagull introduction, red kite introduction, now beaver introduction are all active choices supported by the Scottish government and all of which have a cumulative impact on the viability of our agricultural sector. No, I'm afraid I won't, Stuart. I'm sorry. Presiding officer, land abandonment is a current and real threat in Scotland. 
which could create wilderness on a scale not seen since the 18th century in Scotland, as well as cause the rural depopulation of those with the skills to produce and maintain the working and manage landscapes we currently enjoy. In addition, computers which don't work have taken another £200 million out of Scottish farmers' pockets, and rural payment schemes that reduce or delay cash flows don't really help and reducing LFAS payments just makes a bad situation even worse. And I know the Cabinet Secretary is doing his best to support farmers, but these are some of the day-to-day -day obstacles that need to be overcome just to put food on the table before we can even start considering where we're headed. Of course we need increased productivity, but profitability can't be achieved without, but productivity can't be achieved without profitability. TIF figures again, Cabinet Secretary. Of course, we need environmental protections and enhancement and the delivery of public goods and climate change mitigation, but not if the delivery of these public goods help put farmers out of business. Simplification is long overdue, and a new support scheme under proposed new Scottish legislation should seek to achieve this and perhaps take a leaf from the Irish Government book on how to do this. Education, knowledge transfer, absolutely vital too if our heirs and successors are to be equipped in more sophisticated food production techniques at the same time as delivering on further greenhouse gas reduction targets. And I hope the Cabinet Secretary and Mark Ruskell agree with me when I say being the world leader in climate change mitigation targets is not worth it if we drive farmers and food producers out of Scotland and are forced to buy still more of our own food from other countries in the world to replace lost production here in Scotland. The huge success that has been Scotland's food and drink cannot be continued or sustained without the raw material to do so, and that is constantly reducing, particularly in the life sector, to the point where we will have difficulty sustaining the idea that the end product is derived from Scottish grown produce. So, Cabinet sure. Secretary, you know how important people are in our countryside, and you know how important LFAS payments are to 85% of Scotland's classified less favoured areas, and that's why existing payment rates must be sustained. I commend Donald Cameron's motion. Thank you. Anna Collins, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And let me just respond to a couple of things that have come up in the debate. Uh, first of all, on beavers, I share John Scott's concern about the Tayside beavers. There are now 550 of them descended from what we must remind ourselves were illegally released or escaped, perhaps, but illegally released beavers. The government is picking up the tab for someone else's uh, illegal uh, activity, and I wish we didn't have to do that. But there we are. Um, I do want to uh, pursue uh, the point that Mark Ruskell made on climate change. And again, I think John Scott and I, to a certain extent, will make common cause on this. Um, because uh, what mm -hmm. Mark Ruskell asked for in the context of how we deal with farming going forward is a net zero farming sector emitting net zero. Now, that is actually something that can damage the whole climate change agenda to move the whole of our environment to net zero. It'd be perfectly easy to move the human race to net zero emissions, for example. You just remove all humans from the surface of the planet, you've achieved it overnight. But of course, that's not what you're gonna do. And in asking net zero in farming, you're making a similar suggestion. But equally, I'm really not going to have time. Do forgive me, I'm really watching the clock. I will be caught up, I'm sure. Um, but the real point is that we want to have net zero across all our sectors, but not in every sector. Because we want to spend the pounds to get to net zero where it is most effective. But we also have to remember that farmers don't get enough credit for the efforts they're making. The, the, the work that is done in forestry is not attributed to the farming sector, for example. Um, we have days now where all our el electricity comes from wind farms. Where are the wind farms? They're actually on agricultural farms, by and large, but not a single part of that climate change benefit is attributable to farmers in the numbers that we have. But the bottom line is we've got to spend the money on climate change mitigation and reduction in the most cost-effective way. If putting it into farming is the way that we get the greatest reduction for every pound, then we do it there. 
But if, as is more likely, we put it into insulating houses, if, as is more likely, we put it into decarbonizing our transport sector, that's where we should put it. But if for doctrinaire reasons we decide we put it into farming, where it may not be the greatest bang for our buck, we actually damage our ability overall to reach net zero on climate change. So we need to be very cautious about these, do forgive me, Mr. Ruskell, simplicist views of a complex issue. Now, I've got one minute to go, presiding officer, so do forgive me, Mr. Ruskell. We'll have a chat afterwards. Um, but, uh, but, I, 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 but, but, I, but I do come back to the, the core issue of farming and support for it, which is at the heart of the motion that we're debating. And I, I found it somewhat baffling when Mr. Cameron made his remarks, and indeed Mr. Mountain as well, uh, when I look at what the NFUS briefing to us actually says, it says it's the view of the NFUS that stability and simplicity, the government's document, effectively captured the recommendations from various expert groups appointed by the government in recent years. And I was just saying, it's been a pretty good thing. Now, it's not uncritical and absolute support. I would never expect that from farmers. But they also say it is the view of the NFUS that if the steps to change approach were to be adopted, much of which is required by the way of future support, Scottish agriculture could be delivered with greater efficiency in terms of funding process and outcomes. So the farmers have got the message, they know where we need to go, and I look forward to continue to gauge with farmers in my constituency and across Scotland on the many occasions that present themselves. And indeed, I hope this year at the Tara Show, once again, to be sitting next to Mr. Gove. And I hope we'll be able to account for what the UK government have done in the period since the 29th of March. I'm not holding my breath. Thank you. And we move to our closing speeches. I call Rhoda Grant on behalf of the Labour Party. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. Um, the, the debate improved with time thankfully, um, and hopefully it has given the Cabinet Secretary some food for thought. Um, a number of speakers questioned our amendment and why we would be looking to tackle food poverty and rural poverty in a debate about farming. Well, I repeat again, 45% of farms make an income less than the minimum agriculture wage, and 23% operate at a loss. That is poverty. That can't be anything other than poverty. And therefore, if we're looking at schemes going forward, we need to tackle this. It's simply wrong that people are making huge amounts of money out of the support available. And those, those 45% who really need that help are not getting it. So if we're devising a new scheme, we need to make sure that it, the support goes to the right people. And the same with food production and food poverty, because it, at the moment, we're not, as we can see, paying some of the producers enough, but yet food is not affordable to the, the people, our population. So th these things are inextricably linked, and we need to make sure that if we're looking at support, we need to make those links and make sure that the industry and the support we put into the industry deal with those issues. Colin Smith said that we should enshrine a right to food, a human right to food. And I believe in that. I absolutely think that is something we should do. If we did that, it would inform our policy going forward. And it's, it is the mainstay of our amendment. And I really hope people support it because it's incredibly important. A number of speakers, Mark Rusko, Colin Smith and Stuart Stevenson talked about uh, farming and the environment. And I know that this is a big issue and certainly been looked at at the Environment Committee and the move to net zero. But an, an issue that has come up in the debate, and I think um, Stuart Stevenson spoke about it briefly, it's mitigation. Farming sector mitigate a huge amount of carbon, something that they're not given credit for. So when you look at the outputs from the farming sector, nobody actually looks at what they're, they're sequestrating. And we need to do that to encourage more farmers to do, do take, take on board sequestration and also to reward them for the work that they do. And we need to make sure that any new scheme is not competitive in this direction because I've heard so many people say that they can't qualify for environmental schemes because it's competitive. And how can a small farm compete with a large farm and tick the boxes that they can? 
And John Scott talked about net zero maybe forcing people out of business. Well, we need to speak about this now because we need a just transition. And that means we're not forcing people out of business. What we're doing is making sure that there's support available because we already have too many air miles for our food. We look at, need to look at local producers and local procurement and making sure we cut the air miles from our food, which actually cuts carbon as well. Needless to say, the debate focused a great deal on Brexit, and that is um, not surprising. Mary Goodgen talked about the other rural funding, like LEADER, that we have no uh, knowledge of how, what will be in place going forward. But it would be really good if the Scottish Government looked at what they would prioritise in those schemes. The EU prioritised per peripherality. We need our governments to look at those things. And they, yes, they may be waiting to hear whether they have the money, but we need to make sure that the direction of travel is there, that um, people know what they can expect from future policy. A no deal would be disaster, as Colin Smith said, but actually the backstop for farming is a disaster too, because it includes fish and agriculture, and tariffs would become payable, so that would not improve the situation either. In conclusion, presiding officer, I can see that you're looking at me. Um, Edward Mountain talked about land reform, and he talked about the lack of tenancies and the need to stop land reform. Well, I would argue that that was a reason to push ahead with land reform, because if those who are managing the land cannot provide the tenancy, we need to put it in the hands of those that would manage it for the many, not the few. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, five minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Five minutes. Fergus Ewing. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased that the Scottish Government has set out in our document stability and simplicity in which we consulted uh, last summer proposals for a rural funding transition period of five years. That was a consultation document, uh, and we listened carefully to the responses that we received. These responses were largely positive and supportive. We are now therefore in a position that we have set out a clear five-year plan, which we believe would see the industry through the transition following the UK's exit from the EU, if that indeed does take place. Uh, and I'm delighted that we have had a positive response to that. I respect many of the farmers who sit in this parliament and I listen very carefully to their advice always. And I agree with much of the things that, for example, John Scott has to say about improvements in farming practice. But I think the telling point in this debate, getting to the nub of things, if I may try to do that, presiding officer, as I don't sadly have enough time to answer as I would like to do all the various individual points, the nub is this, that this parliament, in a debate just a few weeks ago, agreed on a certain path it did so by an overwhelming majority. I think everybody except the Conservatives, uh, although uh, if, if anyone in the opposition parties didn't support me, please uh, correct me. But uh, uh, everybody said that what we should do is proceed on the basis of the principles that we set out in that debate with an amendment, which I was happy to accept from Mr. Rumbles, that we appoint a group of people to help guide us and provide advice uh, as to the way ahead after the five-year period is over, presiding officer, as to the long-term future. Now, Parliament having instructed me to proceed in that way, of course I respect the will of Parliament. And indeed, if I were not to do so, then the Conservatives would, I imagine, be the very first to criticise me for ignoring the will of Parliament. I intend to do what Parliament asked me to do. I'm happy to confirm the specific request that Mr. Rumbles made that we are making good progress uh, towards uh, uh, selecting a group of people uh, 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 and consideration with regard to the particular wording of the debate. Uh, and I'm happy to, do, to say that I will be announcing the composition of the group in due course as soon as we can possibly do that. There are practical matters about appointing people to serve on groups. We have to ensure that they're available and ready to do it. This takes a little time to do. Now, um, I'm proud that we have set out our five-year plan, but I did ask one question of the Conservatives at the beginning of this debate, and that question is this. What is the Scottish Conservatives' policy specifically on the future of funding, not just agriculture, but rural policy as a whole? Now, as far as I know, other than some abstract nouns and some desirable sentiments, there is no policy 
whatsoever. It may be, and none of the conservative members mention this at all, it may be that they support the vague proposals as set out in Michael Gove's Health and Harmony paper. But they haven't said, and I think I know why they haven't said that, presiding officer, because Michael Gove is proposing that all direct payments to farmers cease uh, by 227 in eight years' time. Now, is, I mean, I'm happy to accept clarification from Mr. Cameron. Do you support that or not? General Cameron. Firstly, it's your, it's your responsibility to set out what your policy is for your government. And secondly, if you, read, if, you, if, you, if you read the document, you would say that we support direct payments for farmers continuing. Through the chair, please. Cabinet Secretary. What's your policy? Let me offer some advice to Mr Cameron, and I've been doing advice for 40 years as a solicitor and then as an MSP. There is a time when you start to need to develop policies of your own and stop the endless negativity, carping and bickering. I can tell you, uh, I can tell you, you'll get absolutely nowhere pursuing your current approach. That doesn't cause me too much grief, presiding officer. But there we are. I haven't yet I even asked for payment for that uh, advice. I give it freely. Uh, presiding officer, I, I guess I haven't got much time left. Uh, but I find it quite staggering that the Conservatives should bring this motion to the Parliament. Uh, but I will ignore that in one sense, because my job is to do my best for Scottish farmers. I'm determined to do it. That's one of the things that I do every single day. I'm pleased to inform Parliament that over the last few days we've issued 10,600 offers of loan to Elfast recipients. Uh, and that we intend to, to make payments to those who return their acceptance uh, as soon as possible, and preferably before the 29th of March. We will be doing our job for Scottish farmers. The tragedy is that the, the Scottish Conservatives, uh, through cowardice or through their duty to obey, about which we heard yesterday, Mrs May, have said absolutely nothing about Brexit and appear to be quite ready to see Scotland go over the no-deal precipice. The rest of this parliament believes that that is a, a profound and grievous error. Their approach is feckless and reckless. They have nothing positive to say whatsoever, and perhaps a period of prolonged silence would be their best course of action for a week or so. And I call on Peter Chapman to conclude our debate. Peter Chapman. I thank you, Presiding Officer, and I register an interest as a partner in the farming business. Today's debate has allowed an important conversation about the future direction of travel for Scottish agriculture. I have always said that the great prize Brexit offers is the opportunity to design a system of support better suited to the needs of Scottish agriculture and move away from the outdated CAP system that simply has not been working for our farmers for many years. And while, I am glad, and while I am glad that we have had this debate today, it is unfortunate that we on these Conservative benches have had to initiate it, because despite constant requests from everyone in this Parliament and the farming community for certainty on future direction, we only know that this Government intends to carry on with little change to CAP rules until 2024. Cabinet Secretary, this is very disappointing and far too long a lead-in to the changes which can and should be made much more, much more quickly. The NFUS have said Brexit is a golden opportunity for change. And we today have published our plans and I commend, commend them to everyone in this chamber. To read them. My colleagues have explained some of them today and it would appear that the Cabinet Secretary hasn't been listening. Exactly. Nevertheless, I am glad to hear that we all agree that a farmer's first priority is to produce the high quality food we all enjoy. Efficient food production must be built on strong environmental and animal welfare standards. It is therefore important that a suite of environmental measures should be put in place which all farmers can join. Payments should be made for environmental outcomes which are simple to apply for, simple to implement and easily measured. Now, I have always been vocal about my support of the Scottish Government's target to grow our food and drink industry to 30 billion by 2030. However, to double this industry, we must support 
and sustain the growth of our agricultural sector and the farmers who grow the raw materials from which our award-winning and world-renowned products are made. Now, presenting officer, I had hoped that this would be a positive debate today. But of course, Mary Gujan went straight into the usual SNP grief, grievance and yeah. scaremongering mode of a no-deal Brexit. Let me spell out to her and all SNP members here today, the simple way to ensure no deal is to vote for the deal. Listen to the NFUS, listen to NFU England and Wales, listen to business. They want the deal which will give us certainty, give us tariff-free access to EU markets, allow our lamb to flow into Europe. Presiding officer, the hypocrisy from SNP is, is breathtaking. Mary Gujan also said that there was no certainty of funding. Let me explain to her that the UK government has guaranteed support yeah. payments till 2022. And this is more certainty than farmers in the EU have. They have little certainty given that our contribution to the EU will cease and support for agriculture will likely fall as a result. Now, Mark Ruskell in his speech spoke only about, I have no time, about climate change. Let me tell him, farmers are a, farmers are a major part of the solution Keep it down, to climate please. change. Rather hang on than one being second, the Mr. Problem. Chapman. Mr. Chapman, hang Our on. document explains that we would encourage it's carbon it's sequestration. It's in, in particular. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. Our, let me explain that farmers are a major part of the solution to climate change rather than being the problem. Our document explains that we would encourage carbon sequestration. We will, we will encourage the planting of trees. We will support restora uh, peat restoration. We will support more efficient use of inputs with targeted inputs. And we will support efficient livestock production. And I thank Stuart Stevenson for his contribution to that part of the debate today. And in answer to his question, which bigger, uh, to Mark Ruskell's question, which bigger public good is there than addressing climate change? The answer, the bigger public good, is feeding our population. Now, Alistair Allen spoke about the importance of Elfast funding for crofting, and we fully agree. And that is why we talk almost uh, about Elfast at length in our document and say that, we should it sh that it should remain. And, President Officer, let me remind Gail Ross that there are challenges from Brexit, but there are also opportunities. Yeah, yeah. But we must leave with a deal. And we can and we will leave with a deal. And the SNP MPs can help that happen. But will they vote for it? No. Because they want a failed Brexit. They want chaos to drive independence. To close, President, Presiding Officer, I'd like to make clear that whatever future policy this government eventually adopts, I hope today's debate has given them some ideas. And I hope they will come forward with new ideas soon for the continued support for this industry. And let me quote a worrying statistic. Last year, 82% of farming profits came from support payments. Now, this has nothing to do with Brexit. This is before Brexit even happens. This is on your watch. And this staggering figure shows how important it is for the government, both here and in Westminster, to provide farmers with certainty of future farm support and how this will be delivered. In the middle of February, the, the Scottish Government announced the creation of another new group to drive forward recommendations of the National Council of Rural Advisors. Presiding officer, I've lost count of the number of advisory groups and consultations on future policy this government has formed, and yet there is still no clear idea of the de desired key principles and structures. We, the Scottish Conservatives and Unionist Party, have published our desired key principles today to drive future agricultural policy. And we do not have a team of civil servants to crunch the numbers and come up with detailed policy. This government does. And it is time they stopped kicking the can down the road and gave this industry a degree of certainty which they not only need to plan ahead, but which they also deserve. I support the motion in the name of Donald Cameron. Thank you very much. That concludes this afternoon's debate.
The next item of business is consideration of business motion 16150 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Moved, President. Thank officer. you very much. No one wishes to speak against that. The question is that motion 16150 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. The next item is consideration of business motions 16151 and 16152 on the stage two timetable of two bills. Could I call on Graham Day to move these motions? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you. And again, no one wishes to speak against the motions. The question is that motions 16151 and 16152 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you. The next item is, is consideration of eight parliamentary bureau motions. Uh, 16153 to 16159 on approval of SSIs and 16160 on a committee meeting at the same time as Parliament. Could I call on Graham Day to move those motions? Presiding officer. Thank you very much. So we turn to the decision time. Could I remind members that if the amendment in the name of John Swinney is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Ian Gray falls. The first question is that amendment 16122.2 in the name of John Swinney, which seeks to amend motion 16122 in the name of Alison Harris on early years, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 16122.2 in the name of John Swinney is yes, 57, no, 58. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. So the next question is that amendment 16122.1 in the name of Ian Gray, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Alison Harris, be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 16122.1 in the name of Ian Gray is yes, 58, no, 57. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 16122 in the name of Alison Harris, as amended on early years, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 16122 in the name of Alison Harris, as amended, is yes, 58, no, 57. There were no abstentions. The motion, as amended, is therefore agreed. The next question is the amendment 16123.2 in the name of Marie Goujon, which seeks to amend motion 16123 in the name of Donald Cameron on supporting Scottish agriculture, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now.
the result of the vote on amendment number 16123.2 in the name of Mary Goujon is yes 82, no 33. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is the amendment 16123.1 in the name of Rhoda Grant, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Donald Cameron, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We we'll move to a vote. Members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 16123.1 in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes, 88, no, 27. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that the motion 16123 in the name of Donald Cameron as amended on supporting Scottish agriculture be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on, the on motion 16123 in the name of Donald Cameron as amended is yes, 82, no, 33. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. Now, I propose to ask a single question on the eight parliamentary bureau motions. Does anyone object? Good. The question is that motions 16153 to 16160 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the parliamentary bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Gordon MacDonald on Marie Curie's Great Daffodil Appeal. I will just going to take a few moments for members to change seats and the ministers to change seats. <laughs> 